Um, welcome, everybody. My name is Nancy Heil. I'm on the board of the Rattlesnake Creek Watershed Group. We have two other board members here, Matt Tretman and um, Judy Mulland. If you have any questions about our work or how you can help out, we'll be around afterwards um, to chat with you. Our mission is to preserve and protect the Rattlesnake Creek watershed and also to foster um, connection and care for the watershed. So the series that we've been doing is part of that effort. So we're really happy that you're here today. Um, we've been trying to find out how people hear about these talks. So if you heard about this from our newsletter, good. Facebook, great. Uh, word of mouth, okay. And uh, we've been putting up some posters around town. Anybody on the poster? No posters, okay. And then it's also on a Missoula events. Oh, good, okay, all right, great. So kind of an even split this time. Um, we have some sign-up sheets over here for our newsletter. It comes out once a month. Um, and we have various articles about the watershed um, and uh, activities going on as well as some um, natural and cultural history information. We are all volunteer. We have um, some ways that you can get involved to help with um, bear education, weeding, communication. So if you're interested in helping out, um, please do sign up. And today's presentation is being recorded by MCAT as part of a media assistance grant that was donated to Rattlesnake Creek Watershed Group. And so we really appreciate MCAT for their continued work with us on that. So today we're going to hear about Mount Jumbo, which I think is one of our most fascinating landscape features. I love it that we can look, if you duck a little right now, probably right out the window um, and see it. Um, we can see the lines from Glacial Lake Missoula out there. It is part of the um, Aboriginal territory of the Salish and Kalishpe people. And their name for it, um, I'm not going to be able to pronounce it properly, is Nimkichte, um, Humped Mountain. And across the saddle is the trail to the buffalo that was used for millennia to go across the divide and, and hunt for buffalo until the buffalo were nearly exterminated. Uh, Jumbos had a lot of names. We had a short uh, piece in our last news newsletter about Jumbos names, so you can check that out if you're interested. And um, we're really happy to know that a significant portion of Jumbo is protected open space. There was almost a subdivision up there, and there was an amazing community effort in the mid-90s to uh, purchase that. It involved community members, nonprofits, local organizations, local government, and a $5 million open space bond. So were any of you here to help with that effort at that time? Great. We're hoping that in um, another talk, we can, do, we can devote just to that protection effort. Um, so if you'd like to leave your name uh, on the newsletter, maybe we'll talk with you about your efforts with that. Um, so today we're going to be hearing about the elk herd that's up there and why it's important and why it's protected and why it's an important part of the management. And we have Jeff Gicklehorn, who's the Conservation Lands Program Manager at the City of Missoula. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks. I will also try not to speak too loudly into the microphone. So if I do, please let me know. Um, so as Nancy said, we're going to talk a little bit about, about Mount Jumbo. I'm going to give you a very, very, very brief two-slide history. Um, there's a lot more information on the long-term and short-term history of the mountain. What I'm going to largely talk about is uh, the management and conservation of the Mount Jumbo elk herd really since uh, the city acquired that property. Very, very brief history. So as Nancy mentioned, um, Mount Jumbo has been traditionally used by Native peoples in Western Montana uh, for many different reasons. There was a route over the Mount Jumbo saddle, as she mentioned, to avoid ambush in what is now known as Hellgate Canyon along the Clark Fork River. 
One thing that is really interesting is that the mountain was culturally managed. So it was burned off from the saddle to the south approximately every 10 years, give or take. And that cultural management really helped him improve a few things. So one, it was a safety precaution, right? So there weren't any ambush locations, but it also greatly helped improve or increase food resources such as bitterroot. Um, and so bitterroot was traditionally collected. Uh, there are still many, many bitterroot up on the ridge lines on the top of Mount Jumbo and along the Mount Jumbo saddle. But you can see, so this is a, uh, this is a painting, but you can see traditionally there were few to no trees on Mount Jumbo. Very different situation than what we have right now. So again, as Nancy mentioned, um, the mountain was privately owned and ranched in the 1900s. Uh, it was at risk of development in the 1980s and 1990s, and there was a community-driven uh, effort to save the mountain, which led to the passage of the 1995 Open Space Bond, and there was messaging such as, Mount Jumbo, it's now or never. Um, and the main goal was protecting the view shed, but also protecting the overwintering elk herd and their habitat. So the city of Missoula took ownership of just over 1,600 acres of land on top of Mount Jumbo, and this is something that's pretty different. So we took ownership in 1997, but really didn't have active management on the mountain until 2007. So there was a period between acquisition and when the conservation lands management program actually started in 2007 in earnest, where there really wasn't much active management going on. We did have some weed spraying through contracts. There definitely was some level of management, but it was not holistic um, in nature. So the elk herd, right? We have Somewhere between 50 and 100, and I'll actually show you that we now have more than 100, um, elk that overwinter on Mount Jumbo every year. What's really unique about this herd is that this is less than two miles as the crow flies from where we're sitting. It's actually about a mile and a half from where we're sitting, but from downtown at City Hall, it's about two miles to the Mount Jumbo summit. And so that's quite unique. This herd overwinters inside city limits. Most other elk herds you have that overwinter inside city limits, and this is the next bullet point, are very habituated to people. And they are in your neighborhood, eating your flowers. <laughs> and so um, this herd is not. This herd is still wild and is not habituated to people. They react appropriately when they interact with a human. Essentially, they run away from you. Whereas many other elk herds around the Western United States don't. You know, they will walk right through traffic. And I have some photos to show uh, later of what that looks like. Recently, the herd's population has been quite stable. Um, and I'll show uh, later on in the presentation that the population is actually slowly growing over time, which is great. Um, that's not true of all of our local elk herds, even in Missoula. Um, there was a pretty precipitous drop in the Grant Creek elk herd a few years ago. Um, I mean, from 300 down to less than 100 in, over the course of two years. and so. This mountain and this herd, right, are fairly stable. And, as I mentioned, protecting the elk herd and uh, winter range was a main goal for purchasing Mount Jumbo back in the 90s. So what do, from the city's perspective, what is our management goal as it comes to the Mount Jumbo elk herd, right? We want to maintain the quality of the habitat that's available to them, as well as best as possible the health and the wildness of the herd. So if anybody's familiar with resource management or the difference between state and local or federal agencies, the city of Missoula does not actually manage wildlife. Wildlife is the property of the state. And so Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks technically manages the elk. However, they're on city owned land. And so we manage their habitat, right? So, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks is not going up onto Mount Jumbo and doing all of the habitat improvements that I'll talk about later. That's City of Missoula staff and employees. We have many different management strategies that I'll go through, four in particular, to maintain, again, high quality habitat and monitor all of those metrics. So what is the health of the habitat? What is the health of the herd? And then what could happen if we fail? in this effort. 
So one, elk could either leave Mount Jumbo, they could move somewhere else, this has happened in other locations in the West, or they could become habituated to people and human development. And that looks like this. So this is in Estes Park, Colorado, right outside Rocky Mountain National Park, where the herd that summers in Rocky Mountain National Park comes out of the mountains into Estes Park every fall for their rut. Um, and this is, this is a tourist attraction in Estes Park for people from all over the country to come into town and literally be feet, if not inches away from elk. And they're in people's yards, they're eating people's vegetation. It is a pretty large problem, right? And every year there are culling of animals that are becoming over habituated. So we don't have this in Missoula, which is pretty remarkable. We certainly have it with deer. I'm not gonna go into that today. But we don't have it with elk. And it's pretty unique. And it's something that we wanna make sure that we maintain. Right? I'm gonna give you nice slides. These are actually photos from, uh, you know, long range photos from Mount Jumbo or um, game camera photos. But between any of the sections that I'm talking about, we'll have a nice little, so yeah. So this is the elk. Um, just below the summit on the west face. Um, and this is actually looking from down in the university district with a very, very long range telephoto lens. So we have four different management strategies that we employ to do what I mentioned in the prior slide. So these have a pretty broad range. I'm gonna go through each of these in more detail and then I'm happy to answer as many questions as you might have at the end. So those four strategies are to manage vegetation to promote the quality of elk winter range and a diversity of habitats on the mountain. Remember I mentioned that there weren't very many trees before and now we have a lot more trees. Finding that balance between open grass er grassy areas uh, and forested cover is really critical for elk in the winter. We have a seasonal, seasonal area closure. It's in place right now. Uh, which is instituted to prevent direct human impacts to overwintering elk, as well as I mentioned, prevent habituation, right? I, again, I'll go into a lot more detail on that in a little bit. We actually have a citizen science elk spotters program, which helps to collect data on location and numbers of elk. Can I see if anybody is an elk spotter? Yeah, we have, great, we have one elk spotter. So I'll provide more information on that program, and if any of you are interested, how to get involved. And then lastly, we have an annual green up monitoring protocol to inform the appropriate opening dates. And then again, all of these data are um, discussed in consultation with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks regional biologists to determine an appropriate opening date on an annual basis. Oop, missed the nice photo. Some, so you have some really great uh, professional and amateur photographers in Missoula that send us photos. So some of these are not uh, city staff, but yeah, you can see the herd. This is, um, this is further north on the west face, um, trying to think, somewhat near Lolo Street, so above Lolo Street, um, kind of in those grassy fingers between the intact forest stands. Vegetation management. So as I mentioned, right, Mount Jumbo's forests are young and pretty darn uniform in age and structure. So here's a photo from the early 1900s um, showing that with the exception of a few wooded draws or drainages, there were a few to no trees on Mount Jumbo at all. And this is 120 years ago. And so there's been a very rapid forest expansion on Mount Jumbo. The reason that those trees were not there is that this area was culturally managed. And then, right, so remember it was burned every approximately 10 years. And that does a really good job of controlling trees, right? So they aren't able to recruit and grow because when they're quite small, they'll get burned over and die. There are still some trees there and that's how the, uh, the forest expansion was so rapid. If you look at theoret theoretical ecological models, pretty much all of the west face of Mount Jumbo should have trees. It should be our standard um, Douglas fir, ponderosa pine forest type. And so we're in the process of getting there. And so active management is required to, uh, again, balance forest expansion with grassland restoration. 
So forests provide refuge and thermal cover, while grasslands provide forage primarily. So what do I mean by thermal cover? Thermal cover is literally when you're in a really dense forest in the winter, it blocks the wind. And so in those extremely cold uh, situations, right, Mount Jumbo gets hit by the Hellgate winds coming out of the east in the winter, the elk will shelter inside the forest stands for potentially weeks on end, depending on the weather, to ride out those storms. And then between storms, they'll come out into the grassland areas and eat the remaining grass from the prior year. Many of these areas were impacted by grazing in the 1900s, which did unfortunately introduce a lot of invasive species, and we have a lot of invasive species present on Mount Jumbo right now. So again, this is a different perspective. This is from uh, very close to where now Upper Duncan Drive is on the northwest side of the rattlesnake. And I don't actually know a date of this photo, but you will see this compared to a photo from a few years ago, pretty drastically different, right? So, and that's a direct overlay. It's the same exact uh, location. And you can see how different the forest cover is there versus there, right? Pretty different. Oh, excuse me. Oh, what is? There we go. Okay. Um, and so you can see that any any aspect on Mount Jumbo that is um, northwest facing, so all of everything you can see that's forested is pretty much northwest facing or north facing, versus once you go down to the south, anything that's southwest facing currently is a grassland, although you have coniferous encroachment or forest stand encroachment and expansion out into those grassland zones. Don't know what, okay. <laughs> so as it relates to vegetation management in general, we have really two primary strategies. So forest management, I'll go into that in more detail. There was a, a community-driven forest management plan adopted in 2014 which defined the treatment units and then priorities and specific prescriptions for how to maintain uh, an appropriate balance of forested to unforested areas in, uh, on the mountain. And again, I mentioned that diversity of habitats. We also have invasive species control, right? So this is maintaining ecological integrity and protecting, we have mapped relatively pristine uh, bunch grass communities on the mountain and so protecting those as best as possible. If we do have large areas of disturbance, or we intentionally cause disturbance, and I'll go into that in a little, in a little bit, uh, focusing on holistic ecosystem-based restoration actions. So the Mount Jumbo Forest Plan, uh, and you can see that on the map at right, we have these defined forest management units, so they're, they're outlined in blue. Um, and this was, this was the extent of those forest stands in 2014, not what they are now because there has been expansion since then. And what this mountain did, or excuse me, what this plan did was really define the treatment levels and priorities for management of Mount Jumbo's south zone. So the, you know, from the, the saddle to the south. And how do we manage primarily structure, forest stand structure, not necessarily composition, to promote that diversity of habitats? So we sort of have these two different classes of treatments. One is referencing those older photos that I showed, the 1940 photos where if there was a forest stand in 1940, we were essentially trying to maintain that forest stand and allow for healthy expansion. And that means that as the forests expand, we wanna make sure that they're not becoming overcrowded, right? And so we're going in on a frequent basis, but a less intensive basis. Uh, and doing small levels of treatment. So that's class A, which is low intensity landscape level thinning. This is annual. It's, it essentially encourages healthy forest expansion. And for each of these individual forest stands, I'm not gonna call this, these out, but unit eight, for example, down here, uh, our crew was working on last year, we're only gonna treat no more than one acre per year. And so we don't wanna cause a drastic change, but we wanna make sure that as growth and expansion happens, it does so in a healthy way. That's very different than these class B treatments, which are more intensive stand level treatments, typically greater than 10 acres at a time. Um, and we're really focusing on 
these larger intact uh, forest stands, as well as, and I don't have this shown on the map, establishing some fuel breaks to separate those forest stands so that in the case of a fire, hopefully we would prevent a fire from spreading from one stand to another. So here's the same map uh, with, this is data from 2013 used in the 2014 plan, but all these little tiny red dots are uh, elk pellet monitoring points. And so to monitor the, how frequently or intensively an area is used by elk, you know, we have, and I'll go through the elk spotter information, that's helpful, but it's very, um, it's very opportunistic. Versus uh, a standard monitoring protocol in which we can grid out across the entire mountain and actually, no joke, count elk pellets. Um, this was actually, a, we had quite a few citizen volunteers that helped with this project as well. I mean, who doesn't want to go hike all over Mount Jumbo? Um, and we've employed this same approach uh, on Mount Dean Stone now. So if anybody has recreated down there, yep. Um, where, again, we are really looking at the intensity of use and how that changes over time based on the management actions that we're taking. So for example, we build a new trail and we introduce human use, especially in the winter, for example. That might shift where the elk are utilizing. If we implement a forest management action and that, that uh, cover and thermal, um, or the refuge and the thermal cover is reduced, they might move somewhere else, right? Additionally, if we thin an area and we open up the understory, the elk typically flock to that area, but for food, not for shelter, right? And so we can actually see on an annual basis um, how they're moving around the mountain. Additionally, we are monitoring for the presence of forest pests and pathogens. So this could be pine bark beetles, tussock moth, et cetera. Uh, and there are some mitigation strategies against those. So what we don't want to have happen is a full stand failure of all of our forests on Mount Jumbo. That would be pretty drastic, both to residents for recreational and um, uh, sort of our view shed, right? But also it would be pretty drastic for the elk. So we don't want that. And then the amount of work that's required just on Mount Jumbo alone, our program doesn't have adequate staffing, or excuse me, funding to implement. And so we are regularly applying for external grant funding, primarily from state and federal agencies, to help us do this work. So this is just an example of work that was done in 2021. And this is an area on the far western boundary of Mount Jumbo, so halfway down the slope into the rattlesnake, in which we were creating a, uh, essentially a fuel break between one of the intact forest stands and adjacent private property. Uh, you can see I'm in the photo there at left with one of our contractors uh, doing an inspection on the site. And this area was incredibly dense. If anybody has ever heard the term dog hair thicket, this would apply. Um, incredibly, incredibly dense. And so in 2021 alone, we thinned 82 acres between Mount Jumbo proper and then also down into Marshall uh, Canyon on the east side, uh, all with contractors. And you can see the photo at right, it's a little challenging to see, but you can see that the area to the left has been treated. Actually, we ended up implementing a little bit more treatment because based on the inspection, the uh, tree spacing was not what the um, prescription stated or the contract stated. And then at right, they have not worked in this area yet. And you can see it is opening it up considerably. And so the goal of these efforts is to decrease stand density. So if you have a lot of little trees or your mature trees are packed tightly together and, if, and a uh, fire goes through, it will take out the entire stand. It's very easy for that fire that might be on the ground to climb via what are called ladder fuels into the tree canopy. And then if the canopy is connected throughout that entire forest stand, then it can run from one side of the stand to the other side of the stand. And that's essentially full mortality of your tree stand. So we're trying to prevent against that. And in this case, uh, this treatment, again, the sort of the, um, the fuel break was to prevent fire either from moving on to the, from the adjacent private property below onto city property above or vice versa, right? So it's most likely that a fire would start 
in a developed area closer to town and run upslope. That's what fire wants to do. However, we have had situations where fires have started on you know, public lands around the valley and blown down right, into the valley. So we don't want either to happen. What about invasive species control? So again, we have this broad goal of controlling invasive species, primarily in our grassland areas, which really help to maintain native species in general, but also with a focus on elk forage quality. So elk utilize both grass and shrubs in the winter, so especially in a heavy winter when the grass is not accessible or it's under snow. They will browse on shrubs such as nine bark, and that is essential to their survival through the winter, especially in a really bad winter. I mentioned those remnant pristine areas. These are areas that are minimally invaded right now, um, and we're trying to protect those areas or limit the amount of invasive species spread into those pristine habitats. This is a big thing that we found out over time, but every time we come in and implement one of these forest treatments and we open up the forest understory, suddenly we get invasive species just popping out of everywhere, right? The seed bake is present, and if we don't follow up those forest treatments, we will essentially allow the understory to convert into an invasive species dominated um, system. And so, especially within the you know, one to three years after implementing any of these big forest management actions, we then have crews in there, and I'd say one to three, for the successive one, two, or three, not waiting until three years out. But the next year, we're in there making sure that um, any invasive species that are popping up, we are treating as, as quickly as possible. We also employ landscape scale reseeding. So any areas that, let's say, have a fire or disturbance, or again, we're opening the understory, we are going to bring in native seed and apply. What's really interesting, you may have seen these if you're out recreating on Forest Service lands or elsewhere, that um, agencies use slash burn piles. So when you thin a forest, you've got a lot of just material to get rid of, and you mostly dispose of that through burning. Um, open burning, or uh, agricultural burning is open now, and so you may see little smoke plumes coming from all around the valley. And so when you implement a burn pile, it, depending on how hot it burns, it may get close to sterilizing the soil uh, underneath the burn pile. So we don't want that to just be a spot, again, for invasive species to establish into. And so coming in and seeding those burn piles is a really critical component. Last year alone, we seeded over 550 burn piles on Mount Jumbo from work that was, uh, for, the piles were burned in um, late November 2022. And so that's a huge amount of staff effort, but it means that there aren't these little polka dots of invasive species, right, that we can come in, and we, we actually have great success by uh, raking away the ash from the burn pile and then seeding onto fresh exposed mineral soil. And away, I mean, it, it's the best restoration we do on any of our landscapes because we take the time to do it correctly. Oop. Yeah, in 2020, 2019 and 2020, we had a game camera um, up just below the summit and have some really pretty fantastic photos of elk up there. So now let's shift into the seasonal area closure. So we're in the seasonal area closure right now. And why is this important? So this closure came into effect as a function of the 1999 management plan that was adopted after the 1997 acquisition of Mount Jumbo. And the community and the city, so city council adopted that management plan, uh, recognized that it was very important to limit the direct interaction between humans domestic dogs as well, and elk during this critical uh, winter period. And so they instituted an elk, or, I mean, an area closure, and it's actually enshrined in the city ordinance, which is pretty unusual. Um, usually it's just kind of a rule that's made, but this is listed in city ordinance, and I will talk about how that does kind of complicate things uh, for our annual management. So again, it, it really helps prevent that direct harassment. It limits the potential for habituation. 
hopefully preventing the elk from learning that they can just come down into the valley, right? That's not what we want. And this was one of the flyers that came out. It's, again, it's very challenging to read this, but showing the map, you know, this went out with our PSAs initially. People have gotten pretty used to the maps. We have them at all of our trailheads. We have them online. And, um, you know, but this is really what's at stake. Are people really the problem? Why can't the elk just move somewhere else, right? Hikers and skiers do have options, elk don't, right? And so it really was talking through why the closure was there in the first place. And so the city really does rely on residents not only to comply with the closure, so please don't go up onto Mount Jumbo, but also, and I don't know how many individuals live within um, viewing distance of Mount Jumbo proper, but to report trespass. So again, there's this thing where, um, you know, someone may not know and they may go into the closure area. The problem is that could lead to problems. So if anybody's aware of the urban avalanche that occurred in 2014 that killed an individual in the lower rattlesnake, that was caused by a snowboarder trespassing into the closure. So those types of conditions don't occur very frequently, but they do occur. Um, and in 2022, 2022-2023 winter, we did have another urban avalanche warning. We had the conditions that were just right for loading on the top of Mount Jumbo where theoretically, if there had been a trigger, it could have hit the valley floor, right? So not only could an individual trespassing, um, you know, harass or uh, impact the elk, but it could potentially injure or kill somebody else as well, right? So. This is my ask to all of you as neighbors and residents of the valley. If you do see somebody trespassing, well, one, know where the closure area is, and I'll go through that in just a minute. But if you see somebody trespassing into the closure area, please do call 911. Dispatch and city police understand where the closure is, and they will respond immediately. Right? So what are the details of the closure? Right. So the map at right is much higher quality. This is what's given to the public now. Um, and you can see that the entire mountain closes approximately December 1st. In the last 15 years, 16 years, we've only ever closed early once. And that's largely based on recommendations from FWP. So we typically close the mountain December 1st. And sometimes we get uh, earlier weather, for example, in uh, last year, so 2022, 2023, we had a really big snowfall in early November. If anybody likes to ski, you were skiing in mid-November. It was great. We had elk arrive on October 31st in 2022. That's our earliest recorded observation from the elk spotters. We still didn't close till December 1st, largely because there was so much snow on the mountain that people couldn't really get up there, right? And from a wildlife management perspective, it's actually helpful for them to know that they're not really safe until December 1st. So, you know, again, the elk are adjusting their behavior based on any number of threats or risks. And so there's the potential of human interaction or domestic dogs. But December 1st, in most years, is, is a pretty solid closure date, right? We're either getting snow right before that or right after that. It physically shuts down access. Um, and the elk are very frequently on the mountain well before that time. So, but we get this group of about 20 cows, female elk, that come down early. They like to stake their claim on the best spot on the mountain. And then the rest of the herd kind of trickles in over the month of November. So on the map at right, you can see there's a light green section on the north and a dark green section uh, to the south. These are the north and south zones, respectively, split by the saddle road or saddle trail that you can access either from the Lincoln Hills Trailhead in the Rattlesnake or from the Marshall Gray Trailhead in Marshall Canyon. And so they split the north and south zones. Those north and south zones have different reopening dates. There's a very large asterisk here, and I will explain that in detail. So the south zone is supposed to reopen approximately March 15th. Today is March 10th. Uh, the north zone is supposed to open approximately May 1st, right? However, there's this caveat, both in the original management plan and in city ordinance, that states as weather, elk presence, or vegetation dictate, so essentially, it's approximately these dates, 
but we will make a, a decision on an annual basis. What I will state, and we'll get into this later in the talk, is that those dates were fairly arbitrary. If, you, if anybody recreates um, or hunts, let's say, uh, in any of the other FWP wildlife management areas around the state, they all open on May 15th. That's a standard date across the state. Um, and so these dates were somewhat arbitrarily chosen. There was not significant monitoring data to really inform those dates. And so now, 16 years later, we have significant monitoring data that shows how effective those dates have been. Several areas do remain open year round. So the US West Trail and the Lower L Trail. So you can hike up to the L just on the trail. Please don't go past, past the L. Um, we do ask if you do hike up the L, please put your dog on leash because you're getting in fairly close proximity to the elk. Um, we have had this year, we've had one observation about a quarter mile away from the L. Typically they stay further away. So we think that was just some youngsters that were wandering down there to see what was going on um, and then realized that there were people there and that's not where they wanted to be. We also have an area below uh, or below the Lincoln Hills Trailhead. So if you live up in the upper Rattlesnake, there are some sort of neighborhood trails there. You can walk on Lincoln Hills Road. That's open all winter. You just can't go above that point onto the mountain proper. And then also uh, Marshall Grade, this whole area accessed from Marshall Canyon, that's open year round as well. So again, same thing. The areas in gray here and then the trails in black at the bottom, those are open year round. So you can still recreate on the fringes of Mount Jumbo, but just not in the core. We also have a real time, um, I'm not gonna click on this, but a real time um, status for the North and South Zone closures. And so if you go to our conservation lands closures page, this is just a screenshot at the bottom, we literally have north and south zones and whether or not they are open and closed. That will change to green for the south zone when we open it. If there's an extension, any update will be posted here as well as uh, distributed through social media and standard media. So the goal is, is that if you have a question, right, and you don't know whether or not it's open and you don't want to drive up into the rattlesnake to find out, you can find out online. So that's been a fairly recent addition that we have this sort of real-time status. Again, just we were getting calls all the time, and rather than that, we will update this in real time, sort of the moment that it opens. Yep. So we have the elk spotters program. This is really cool. Um, again, we've got one elk spotter here. Thank you. Appreciate that. And this is citizens that live, primarily live, around Mount Jumbo and they collect daily observations to help inform you know, management decision making. So what type of data is collected? So uh, these, these data are used to track the herd behavior over time. So it helps us in making decisions and knowing where the elk are, when do they arrive on the mountain approximately, when do they leave the mountain, uh, group size, location, you know, and again, which areas they're using. So I've mentioned we have internal monitoring. We get to go count elk poop. But we can't do that in real time. We can't do that during the winter closure because we are not going up there, right? Just like the public is not going up there. And so um, we're asking residents to let us know, hey, did you see elk today? Also, did you not see elk today, right? So negative observations are equally as important as positive observations because you know, we want to know where they aren't. So for example, if someone reports the entire herd on the, on the east face because they live in East Missoula, well, is it that the whole herd is on the east face or they only saw a part of the herd, for example? So if nobody reports a positive observation on the west face, then we know it's likely that the entire herd moved to the east face for some reason, right? So those negative observations are equally as important as the positive observations. Um, if you're interested in finding out more, I've got one more slide on this, actually a few more slides on this, but if you're interested in finding out more, um, it's very easy to sign up and um, we have a program website that's shown here at the bottom, but if you just search Mount Jumbo Elk Spotters, it's the only link, and it'll take you right there, um, and we have our reporting um, uh, spreadsheet on there as well, reporting form, excuse me. So. The day, again, the data that's reported is the date and time of the sighting. Typically, we ask people to try to do it about the same time every day. So if you get up at 6 and it's light by 7, take a look outside and see if you see them. Keep in mind, there's nobody 
that's an elk spotter that can see the entire mountain. So if someone is looking at one zone, right, let's say this southwest face that you can see from here, right, so if you live in the lower rattlesnake, you can see that area potentially. Um, if you live in the upper rattlesnake, you can see different zones. If you live in East Missoula, you can see that side. And so we want to know where that location is, right, where the animals are. Generally a count, this is what we typically get. There are some individuals with very high power spotting scopes and who are, you know, hunters by hobby that will also give us number of bulls, number of cows, and juveniles. And again, that information is really helpful because we transmit that to Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Every spring, they actually fly Mount Jumbo and count. And so they, we compare our data to their data that they collect when they fly the mountain in a helicopter. Um, so this is just a very quick snapshot of the week of February 22nd, right? Uh, you can see a negative observation there down. And we did not have elk in the lower rattlesnake, far bottom left. Um, all of our positive observations, you should be able to see my mouse here, are up here on the west face, except for one up here in East Missoula, right? And again, these individual points I'm showing here don't give you an indication of how many individuals right, were reported. But we have those data embedded in each of these observations. So essentially, this could be the entire herd of 100 plus. It could have been five. But we know that we have multiple sightings in the same area right, with some minimal use over here. And, and the reason that's important is I have an animation on the next slide to show you an entire winter's observations, which is really pretty cool to see how they move around the mountain. Really quickly, I'm going to open this, which is our so this is the elk spotter's reporting form. And it's very simple. So you know your name, it's actually optional. We're going to change that to mandatory <laughs> because we have anonymous data that we can't track down. So if you are an elk spotter, we do need to know. You, know, you could use your initials. That would be fine. But we do need to know who you are just so if we have a question, which we occasionally do, we can track that down. Date, time, the exact location. I can literally zoom and drag to right at the summit, right there, for example. That's the location. It automatically populates the lat long coordinates, the number of elk observed. Again, I mentioned anything else and just any general notes. It's very simple. It's very easy. Uh, you know, those notes would be, you know, notable weather, observed small avalanche below summit. That would be extremely helpful. Um, observed trespass, uh, you know, police responded, something like that. So uh, it's, it's very simple, um, and we have a lot of residents that help us out by collecting that information. Oh, it's, I guess it's the next slide is the animation. But these are those elk spotter zones that I mentioned, both the south jumbo. So again, kind of lower rattlesnake primarily. You can see Lolo Street here. The L is right here. My cursor is on the L, yeah. Yep, yep. So the reason that we have these zones is that this is also, this plays into our vegetation management, right? So we're implementing forest and invasive species management actions in these zones. And so if understanding if the elk are heavily favoring a particular zone uh, is actually helpful for us. I showed you the uh, data entry form. We have gone away from reporting the zone uh, uh, letter. In the past, before we had that online form, someone was just saying, I saw 25 in zone H. And so it's not quite as exact. That being said, we can take all of those observations and overlay them on these uh, and on the back end really uh, inform our management. So what, uh, what do elk observations across an entire year look like? They look like this. You'll see the little cursors moving, or little icons moving all around the mountain. The weeks, the start of the week is shown in the date at top left. And you can see that they're moving all throughout the mountain. And as we get into the spring, they start moving up into the north, into the north zone. So come April, you can see all, of, all or most of our observations are up at the top. So it's, the dates are not going to repeat, the animation will repeat. 
But essentially, we can in understand where that when they're arriving, right? So again, the first observation in 2022, fall of 2022, was October 30th. We had that really heavy snowfall on November 7th. And so I think they, you know, if anybody has a uh, uh, artificial knee or something, and you know, you know that the weather's coming, right? Probably same thing. They were up high. They got hit by weather earlier, and they started coming down, right? And then we got hit lower down, and then the snow stayed through. I have a couple photos of what it looked like last spring. You know, it stayed through early April. And so again, we have this is again this doesn't give you an indication of how many. We were observed at each point, uh, but we have all of those values, and you can see they shift up to the north come April. So it's very helpful for us, and we don't actually give an award for this, but I would love to, which is who has the high count for the year, right? And this is really helpful because I mentioned Fish, Wildlife, and Parks actually flies the mountain, but they do that one time per year in late March. And they could miss some of the individuals, right? And so we look across our entire year's worth of data and find what the high count is. And I say that in that you could have individuals observed at different times on the same day, and we can't combine those to say, well, actually, there's 150 up there because someone observed 75 in the morning and 75 in the afternoon in a different location. That could be the same 75. And so, in most cases, those observations have to be around the same time or potentially by the same observer. And so you can see that going all the way back to 2013, 2014, on the left, we were down at 65 per year. We then grew pretty drastically up to 100 in 2017, 2018. Population crash, right, back down to 78. And then we've been steadily growing since then. This year, the high count is 109. Again, this is also just below the summit um, on the west face. So what about that spring green up monitoring that I mentioned? Why do we need to do this? Why can't we just stick with that March 15th or the May 1st date, right? So what's the need to actually inform our annual decision making? So elk require three inches of new grass growth to replenish their depleted energy source. So in the winter, when they're grazing on the dried senest grass from the prior year, they're essentially just trying to maintain. And in a really bad winter, like last winter, uh, it can be very challenging them for, for them to access that uh, food, right? The new grass growth is extremely high. Uh, uh, it's extremely valuable and extremely high protein content. And so it actually allows them to replenish their stores over a long winter. Everything else that they've been eating prior to that is not really replenishing them. It's just kind of holding them over until the spring comes around. This differs from, um, let's say, mule deer, for example. They can utilize one inch of new grass growth. And so essentially, they need more forage on any given plant. And so it takes a little longer to get there in the spring, right? And in particular, rough fescue, if anybody knows this species, nicknamed kind of the old man of the mountain, the really big bunch of grasses that we have on Mount Jumbo. That's their most critical uh, spring food source. So assuring that there's adequate forage available before we reopen the south zone to the public is very important. And I say that in that once we do that, the elk do this. They go whoop right to the north zone because they don't want to be around people and or dogs, right? And so the north zone is still closed, but the south zone is open, right? Yes, people stay on trail. Yes, elk can potentially get away from them. But all of our data shows that very quickly, within a few days after opening the south zone, the elk are pushed. They're not electively going. They're pushed to the north zone. And so it's really important that if, we're, if they're going to be pushed to the north zone, there's adequate forage available or food available for them in the north zone. And so our goal of really developing this protocol, we've, we've been in the past, I mean, I say this 15 years ago, um, we were not making very informed decisions, right? We were largely basing our decisions on the snowpack and not actually looking at the vegetation. So, hey, if it's a really bad winter and there's a lot of snow, we're gonna 
hold it over. If there's not, like this year, we're going to open it sort of as planned. And that was fine in the past. We didn't really have the staff internally to implement these monitoring protocols, and we do now, right? And actually, that increase in staffing is, if anybody lived here in 2018, there was an open space bond, another open space bond that was passed, along with a conservation and stewardship mill levy, so a tax levy that funds the conservation lands management program. And that position is a direct result of that uh, conservation stewardship mill levy. So that increased capacity, the ability to make better, more informed decisions was due to residents supporting the maintenance or the staffing and stewardship of the conservation lands management program. So the goal of this is to use vegetation phenology, or I'll say condition, uh, to inform the appropriate south zone opening date. And I mentioned this, be defensible in our decision making. So if someone says, hey, I really just want to go for my hike, right? Well, let me explain to you why we're going to extend, for example. And so here's the process. So beginning in late February, depends on the year. Last year we started in early March because there was still a lot of snow on the ground. This year, very little snow on the ground. We started in late February. We have staff going into the north zone to assess that green up. And we're really looking at the south and southwesterly aspects. So these are the warmest aspects. They typically melt off first. And those are, whoop, sorry, this area approximately shown at, nope. Uh, shown in yellow. So um, if anybody hikes, again, uh, not jumbo, and you're going up the saddle road, this is the area upslope to your left, um, kind of between the three, you know, west side of the North Loop Road and the Sound of Music Trail, there are these south and southwesterly aspects. And so what are we measuring? We're measuring snow depth, right? Is there even snow coverage? Um, in many years, yes, there is significant snow coverage, but those south and southwesterly aspects melt out first. And so it's very common that you'll have snow coverage on the north aspects and no snow, no snow coverage on the south or southwesterly aspects. The percent of grasses that are actively growing, so looking across a large area and taking representative samples, and measuring the average length of the growth by aspect. And so what I mean by that is sometimes we see differences between south and southwesterly aspects. Um, and then we're documenting those with photos. And communicating those to internally to city staff and also to Fish, Wildlife, and Parks so they're aware. We can use these data points to plot a growth curve. So if we see uh, half of an inch of growth and then four days later it's one inch and then four days later it's two inches, it's an accelerating growth curve, right? And we know that we should hit those thresholds that we have, or the trigger, excuse me, on a forecasted date, right? We also take into account both recent weather patterns and short and long-term weather forecasts. So I expected it to be sunny today. It's not. Uh, if anybody's looked at the 10-day forecast, they're saying 60 degrees and sunny next weekend, right? That's a significant increase and warm up. And so I would expect to see a significant amount of new growth as a function of that. And so this trigger that I have at bottom here, this is really, this is really what we're making the decision on. So this is directly from Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, regional biologists, and they want to see 75% of the bunch grasses in those south and southwesterly aspects showing at least three inches of new growth by the time we open. That means that the entire herd can go to that area and have as much forage as they need and replenish their uh, resources, right? It doesn't mean that we have to wait till we hit that to schedule the opening. But again, I mentioned that growth curve. If we are collecting data points every, you know, twice a week and we forecast that we're going to be there in, let's say, three, four days, then we can schedule the opening three, four days out from that last monitoring point. So this is what the North Zone of Mount Jumbo looked like at the end of March, right? So remember, it's March 10th. We're supposed to open March 15th. This was March 31st, right? Uh, I was up there with our research and monitoring specialist on this day, and we hit a snowdrift of 21 inches. So last year, exceptionally long winter, followed by exceptionally rapid melt-off. In less than two weeks, we went from that to that. And these are uh, not the exact same photo, but you can see here's the, the you know, backbone, the south zone, and you can see it there. That's what happened in two weeks. Right? 
And so we did actually have some green up by March 31st, but what was happening is that we'd get this period of melt off, a little bit of growth, and then it would snow again, and it would shut everything down. And then it would melt off, and it would green up a little bit, and then it would snow again, and it would shut everything down. And then, you know, basically the first week in April, it all melted off immediately. And once we had this, we saw just explosive grass growth, right? Um, and so again, this is really variable based on an annual basis. So every year is drastically different. And then we opened the mountain, the south zone, excuse me, April 13th. So that was 27 days later than we are supposed to open it. And it was our second latest opening on record. The only other opening was one day later on April 14th. So, um, and that was also an extremely um, heavy snow year. So I've got a figure here that I'm gonna walk you through, and, and this is where those data points are really, really valuable in terms of making decisions. So uh, these are the south and north zone opening dates by year or by winter, right? So, and the different lines or different rows are the different years. And it's going, it's sort of in reverse order from 2007, 2008 winter at the bottom, which is the first year we were really collecting data, all the way up to last year, 22, 23 at the top. And I've plotted the March 15th opening date, this first black line. So again, the orange bars are the south zone opening date and the blue bars are the north zone opening date. March 15th is this first black bar here, and May 1st is this second black bar here. So this is really to you know, sort of disclose how frequently we either open early, we open late, right? open on time. And in the last 16 winters, we have only ever opened on time or early one year, six out of those 16 times. So 10 of the 16 times we have extended. And that monitoring protocol that I mentioned, we've been using for the past five years. So our data in the last five years has been much better and much more defensible. And so we haven't opened on time, and I'm using air quotes here, since 2014, 2015 winter, right? Because really actually having monitoring data is telling us that opening on time on March 15th is too early. The vast majority of years, it's too early, right? We, we would have to have probably the worst winter imaginable followed by an extremely rapid warm up in early March to hit that threshold. And so what happens if we think about a more appropriate date, such as April 1st, right? If we were to look at April 1st, right, we have only extended past April 1st four times, and those have all been fairly recent. So again, 2013, 2014, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 22, 23. Each time we've extended past April 1st, we've also extended the north zone past May 1st. Usually it's because the snowpack is so heavy that they physically can't move from the north zone further up into the Rattlesnake Mountains, right? And so most of the time in here, so one, two, three, four, five, six years, we've opened between March 15th and April 1st. Again, if anybody's lived in Missoula for a long time, you know how every time we extend the closure, it's a bit of, well, you may want to go recreate on the mountain and you might get to a trailhead and there's a sign that says, oh, I'm sorry, closure has been extended, right? So if you didn't know that information, it, it could potentially ruin your day, right? It's a huge administrative burden for us to try to get the word out because we're making that decision essentially only a few days before the closure is set to reopen because we're using monitoring data. And then we have to mobilize. We have permanent signs out there that say that the closure is in place. Now we're going to print temporary paper laminated signs to slap on top of that sign and say, I'm sorry, closure is still in place, right? It's extended. So it's a use of resources. It's confusing to the general public, right? And we've got a lot of users who just, they just want to know when it's open, right? And so it does become a challenge, right? The majority of times we are extending beyond March 15th. And that's for a reason. It's to protect the elk and because the monitoring data is indicating 
that were not ready yet, even though there might not be that much snow on the mountain, for example. And, you know, again, it, it is a bit of, it's a challenge, right, for both managers, myself included, and the public to know how they can sort of behave responsibly, right? People want to do the right thing, but they have to know that information as well. And so either, again, you're going to walk or drive to your trailhead and try to go for a hike and then realize that, I'm sorry, you can't. Some people will still choose to, regardless, which then has the potential to impact elk, right? Or what we could do is have a more appropriate date where it would be a lot easier to open early than it would be to extend, right? So if it was supposed to open April 1st and we were gonna instead, let's take 2021, 2022 year, I believe we opened March 23rd or 24th, so it would be a week early, that would be a bonus week, right? And that would be very easy for us to, again, track the monitoring data, right? We know where we're hitting that trigger and for then uh, us to announce that, well, look, we're gonna hit that earlier than that April 1st date. So, you know, again, it's, it's an example of where when that ordinance or when that language was put into the ordinance, it wasn't based on monitoring data. We now have 16 years worth of monitoring data and it shows us that that March 15th date is the vast majority of times too early. The May 1st date, on the other hand, is actually quite appropriate for the North Zone. And again, the only time we've extended past that is when we've extended past the April 1st date for the South Zone. So you would know, one would know that if you extended past April 1st, sort of the you know, better opening date for the South Zone, we would probably have the commensurate extension on the North Zone, right? And it might be a few days, might be a week, for example. Last year, I, I showed those photos of the, um, the really rapid melt-off. We opened the South Zone 27 days late, and we opened the North Zone four days late. So that tells you how strange, again, it was very strange, but again, we were still going out and monitoring uh, snowpack and vegetation even though the South Zone had reopened because we anticipated some extension, uh, but we only ended up extending four days. So what does that mean for this year? This is the big question, right? What's happening? We're five days prior to opening. So despite one of the worst winters on record, the Upper Clark Fork watershed is at 65% of snowpack. This is bad. Um, and low snowpack on Mount Jumbo in particular, green up is quite slow. So this is the direct March 8th observation from last Friday, that we only have approximately 5% of our bunch grasses. We're looking for 75% are actively growing, and most of those are less than one inch, not three inches. So it's dry, but it's not warm, really. And the ground is still frozen a few inches down. We anticipate a rapid and significant warm up next week, if that forecast holds. And we're still getting full herd observations in the south zone. They have not electively moved to the north zone. So, I'll be the first one to go on record and say, we anticipate a small extension, potentially up to a week. We don't anticipate a long extension. The snowpack isn't really there, right? But the messaging around this, right, from a um, you know, public engagement perspective, it differs because last year we had an exceptionally long winter. And the worry is that if elk are harassed, they could potentially, um, they could lose, right, babies essentially, right, so uh, pregnant females give birth in May and June and that stress could potentially um, cause them to, you know, abort pregnancy, that can happen. Um, and at the very end of the spring, or excuse me, very end of the winter, they're in their weakest state because they have not had high quality forage in a really long time especially last year, which the winter lasted almost six months. This year, it's a little different, right? It's a pretty dry winter. They've had access to grass. Granted, it's not you know, high quality forage necessarily all winter. Um, we have been above average temperatures with the exception of that, except for, except for the month of January where we had the 30 degrees below zero, right? Um, but generally, we've been above average uh, weather-wise, or temperature-wise, excuse me. Uh, but it's still the same thing, right? It's not so much that we're going to kill elk, but that we could still harass and habituate them, right? And so by not being careful, we could still lead to those outcomes that we don't want, which is 
either for them to leave or to die off or to come down into town. We don't really want any of that. We want them to stay on the mountain and for the herd to be wild up on the mountain and for us to be able to see them from the valley. That's great too. What does that mean long term? So essentially March 15th, you know, that date for the south zone is it's pretty much too early. You know, and again, the the more data points we collect, the better or the more defensible that assertion is. And that's true even in this year, which is an exceptionally dry year. Right? An April 1st opening date would allow for early openings if possible, right? If the data indicates we're going to hit that trigger on, again, March 23rd, we'll open on March 23rd because that's what's biologically appropriate and safe for the elk. But it also limits the management burden and the confusion for residents to know when they can appropriately go onto Mount Jumbo. Luckily, that May 1st date, whoever came up with that date, is, um, is really appropriate. And the vast majority of times, we have hit the conditions by May 1st for the North Zone. So that means that we, as you know, City Parks and Rec, as the land managers in consultation with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, we need to continue maintaining right, the area up there and continue to improve and restore habitat quality. And then we need to continue monitoring uh, both vegetation, elk, and recreational usage. So that can help us inform our management decision making as we go forward. Thank you. We'll take questions, but we'll use the pass the microphone around if anyone wants to ask one. So given that last bit of data, will the April 1 deadline be instituted pretty soon? Does it have to be voted on by the city or? Yeah, so it has to be an update to the ordinance. Um, it's not something, we have many other high, many other priorities in the city right now. Um, no, and I, I say that across the entire city. And so uh, in time, yes, I suspect so. But, you know, a, an ordinance or a law is a political decision. Ideally, it's informed by science, but it's a political decision. And so um, as city staff, we can provide a recommendation, but it's up to the elected officials to make that decision. Um, and, you know, keep in mind that if that date is changed, it would, quote unquote, take away potentially two weeks of time that the public has access to Mount Jumbo. However, again, the data is showing that that would be a much more appropriate date and we could always open early. It would still be very easy to open early. And then everyone would just be pleasantly surprised. Yeah. Um, I think I have the mic. Can I the pass it to you? Um, thank you for this. I'm one of those people who's um, a little anxious, but I'll just go to the North Hills <laughs> um, till you open. This was really great. I was wondering if you had any, um, could share any information about the elk in um, the last hundred years, uh, looking at numbers or just um, what they used to do prior to those last 20 years of data keeping? Specifically on Mount Jumbo? Yeah, on Mount Jumbo, sure. Yeah, like this elk herd, did mm -hmm. it exist? Do we know? That kind of thing. I, so I'm not 100% sure. I, in, in digging, you know, up sort of prior records, we don't really have any news stories, for example, or coverage of elk on Mount Jumbo in the winter. Probably because there really wasn't, there weren't any forests there um, or large forest stands. It's probable that they just stayed further up in the rattlesnake. And so they were using a similar area just further up, you know, not on the south zone of Mount Jumbo, um, but, you know, further up into what is now the Rattlesnake National Recreation Area. That's my guess. Um, so, and that's the thing, they really do need both the open grassy slopes like this for forage, as well as those really dense forest stands for cover and protection. Um, yeah, <clears throat> great presentation. Um, I was just wondering, do you have any plans to reinstitute cultural burning in those treatment areas that you've, so you don't have to keep going in and doing that? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so. Yes, not necessarily in the same way. For example, um, the entire mountain was burned, right? Um, and it was used to maintain as an open, gra open grassland, right? We are moving forward with uh, implementing prescribed fire in the way that uh, many of our partner state and federal agencies are doing. And so, for example, just above Mount Jumbo on the Rattlesnake National Recreation Area, the Forest Service has been implementing a lot of 
um, forestry actions as part of the Marshall Woods uh, landscape scale restoration plan. And you've probably seen quite a bit of smoke coming out of Marshall Canyon in the last couple years. That's primarily been burning um, slash piles. They are moving into the phase of broadcast burning, right? Um, and so, yes, it's a little more complicated on city land because we're in much closer proximity to private property, just downslope. And there are somewhat different political considerations around intentional use of fire. We do know that if you add fire to those thinning actions, it takes your treatment return interval, so the time you need to come back from 10 to 15 years out to 25 to 30 years. So it actually doubles the amount of time, which means it's half the amount of work, right, to do uh, that forest restoration, and it provides significant ecosystem benefits rather than just preventing fire from occurring and, you know, at all. And so we're looking at moving that direction, again, for our ability to get sort of staffed up, trained, and then work with partners. It's, it's a pretty heavy lift. We do have a cooperative agreement with uh, Forest Service, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and the city to use prescribed fire in the north zone and that project would be led by the Forest Service because it, they're already gonna be burning on their land and it would essentially just come over into city land. And again, that would be uh, a direct goal of winter elk habitat restoration. So, yes. I have a question about the overall health of the herd. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things is as more people are recreating on the mountain and they're leaving dog poop and dog poop bags, which drives me insane, um, it really does. Um, how does that affect the herd, chronic wasting disease, and what are you finding in terms of management of other species that are also there, like mountain lions, and what's happening with the whole ecosystem? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't know if I can speak. I don't know if I can speak to the specific impacts, but certainly it is very important as any recreational user to reduce your own impacts, right, on others and on the landscape, and you know, wildlife are included in that. So picking up dog waste not just putting in the bag and leaving it on the side of the trail um, is, is very important. So I, I don't, again, I don't know if I can speak to that. I can speak to the fact that we have had significantly more wildlife observations on Mount Jumbo in the last few years, or at least reported wildlife observations. Uh, probable wolf sightings, um, moose, you know, uh, I haven't, don't have a mountain lion sighting up there, but we did have one, um, the Rattlesnake Main Corridor, if anybody, um, like half mile from the trailhead, right on the trail as part of a uh, visitor use management study implemented last year. So again, as, as we improve habitat quality and we sort of protect this area through that seasonal closure, we will see more wildlife coming in. Certainly predators, right? Potentially um, trying to hunt the elk, although I have no reported observations of, let's say, a wolf coming down and actually trying to get an elk that's in view of the city. So, yep. Yeah, they're definitely there, and we probably just don't see them, yeah. Do you know if the elk in off-season, like in summer, are true to a certain area in the upper rattlesnake, or do they sort of roam everywhere? Yeah, they're going actually even further north, so into the rattlesnake wilderness, and then also all the way up into the Jocko. So they move pretty far. Um, and they actually join with the Grant Creek elk herd in the, well, I shouldn't say join. They share space with the Grant Creek elk herd. Um, I don't think that they sit in one location in the same way that they do on Mount Jumbo in the winter. They actually cross uh, the Jocko River sometimes, too. Yes. Yeah, yeah. they move pretty far. Yeah. I think you said 2008 they had a decrease in the number of elk. What was mm -hmm. the reason for the decrease and then what allowed it to come back? Yeah, so I'm not, I can't actually speak to that. The fact that we only started monitoring in 2007, that downward trajectory was probably already happening. So our first data point was higher and then it went down, but that's probably, probably because it was already on a decline. Um, so I don't know if I can speak to that. Certainly chronic wasting disease was not here. It is here now. It's being detected um, you know, occasionally in Western Montana and Fish, Wildlife and Parks is monitoring that very closely. I'm not aware of any chronic wasting disease that's gotten into any of our local elk herds. And so, but that is something, right, that could cause a pretty, um, you know, de pretty rapid decline. Um, you know, I, I, again, I can't speak to specifics. Prior to 2007, we had really, really had no active management, right? So 
if the force stand structure was not appropriate or there were expanding invasive species or any number of things and there's just generally decreasing habitat quality or that winter uh, closure was not being enforced, any number of things could lead to a decline in the population. But then starting in 2007, there was much more uh, focus on enforcement and on investment in maintenance and restoration. And so yes, we had a little bit of a dip again, but it seems to be on an upward rise now. What is the number that they couldn't enforce? That number seems to have worked pretty well, doesn't it? Yeah, I don't. Um, it, I'm going to. So there's always the carrying capacity of a property or of a, of a site, right? So, and do the forage resources um, support a higher number of elk? We, it's definitely still going up, and we're honestly a little surprised, right? So in 2000, we had, um, or 2004, excuse me, we had 100. And then again, we had 100 in 2021, 2022, or 2022, 2023. And so, I don't know, I'd be very happy to see how high it goes. That being said, there will probably be a crash at some point, and that will indicate what our carrying capacity is. Yeah. Just a curiosity question. When you reseed underneath those slash burns, mm -hmm. what kind of native plants are you reseeding? We're primarily seeding grasses and shrubs. Yeah. So um, really focusing on understory restoration. You know, the goal of those actions are to thin out the overstory or the forest. Um, but when you do burn the piles, you kill everything that's on the ground. And so the goal is to restore with our native grasses and shrubs as best as possible. Um, and so for example, so this is on Mount Jumbo, if we were to have an impact on a south facing grassy slope, that's a different seed mix than we would use in a forest understory, uh, right? Yeah. So we have multiple different seed mixes, largely based on the same uh, three to four bunch grass species as sort of the, the anchors. Mm -hmm. But then we vary the wildflowers of the forbs and the shrubs based on the elevation and location that we're going to be implementing that seeding. And one quick, is Wood Gulch Trail open? Woods Gulch Trail is open year round. So yes, okay. that's on Forest Service property and that stays open year round. The only restriction is that it's closed to dogs between December 1st and February 28th. Okay. That's the area to the west. You can say I, I don't. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So you can go up Woods Gulch, but then you can't come south onto Mount Jumbo if from Woods Gulch, if that makes sense. So once you get up to the ridge, you have to go north. You can't come south. Yeah. Yep. What was the cause of the Grant Creek drop in elk population? Yeah, again, I, I can't speak to the specifics there. I do know it was probably sort of artificially inflated, or, or in, there was an artificial increase. I do know they were coming down into Grant Creek and getting into some of the fields that were there. Um, but it seems that the herd is sort of fairly stable now. So it's, it went from almost 300 down to between 85 and 100. Um, yeah, it's a pretty drastic decrease. And those elk disappeared. Either they went somewhere, which I'm not aware of, or they died off in, over the course of two years. Um, and I don't know if that was because some of the food resources that they were relying on went away, right? Um, there's also been a lot of development going on up in that area. Again, kind of this is the far western edge of the North Hills, right, right as you get into Grand Creek. And so it's unclear what caused that. But again, they seem fairly stable now. And so speaking to the carrying capacity question, it's probable that the carrying capacity was actually quite a bit lower. And something was artificially inflating that capacity temporarily. Yeah. How is the invasive species um, outlook on Mount Jumbo? It, yes, it's a challenge. So um, if anybody's aware, we previously had a sheep grazing program. And uh, we tried that again in 2022. And unfortunately, that uh, rancher that we worked with didn't really work out for us. They weren't local. And so the challenges around managing that, managing that contract were, were very large. Um, and so we don't utilize sheep really in the same areas that the elk are. There's a little bit of overlap close to the top of the mountain. But the majority of areas that we're grazing with sheep are further down slope. Um, for example, if anybody Spring 22, if you drove along the I-90 corridor at the south face of Jumbo, was neon green with leafy spurge. Um, the next year, it actually wasn't, because that's an area we effectively grazed. And so sheep work very well in our heavily invaded areas. 
they don't work well in our minimally invaded areas. And so where you have an area that is mostly weeds, it, I mean, I've heard leafy spurge described as candy to sheep. They will eat those plants to the ground and they will avoid all of your natives. They will really target the invasive species. But if you put them in an area that is minimally invaded, where there are more natives than non-natives, now they're gonna you know, impact the natives. So the goal with sheep is really a control of our heavily inundated areas. And then we're utilizing tools such as you know, chemical herbicide application, really in a targeted manner, so spot spraying, as well as then restoration seeding um, in those areas that are minimally invaded. And I would say we've had really good success uh, protecting our pristine areas. So um, again, it's, you can't quite see it here, but to the south, those, those grassy fingers along the west face, those are fairly minimally invaded, and so we've had really good success at maintaining those. Other areas, uh, we see invasion fronts that were pushed back about 10 years ago, starting to move back up slope. So for example, where Rattlesnake Drive goes up and makes the sort of 45 degree curve, it gets really, really close to the mountain. Just above that, there's a leafy spurge invasion front that's just slowly marching back up the mountain. And so that was work that we invested in about 10 years ago and pushed it way back down. We've been working elsewhere throughout our 5,000 acre system. and so but now we're moving back into that area. Uh, we have to because the weeds are coming back. Yep. So, oh, we'll do one last question and then I've got one last question. Um, if I remembered right, it looked like there was um, another population drop for, uh, between 2017, 18 and 18, 19. Mm -hmm. So granted, maybe nobody knows, but 2017 summer was a really heavy fire year. Mm -hmm. um, does, did that maybe hurt the grazing and there was impacted calving the spring of 18? Yeah, that's a great question. It could have potentially impacted their summer range as well, right? So there was the um, Bees Cove fire up in the Rattlesnake that same year. And so it potentially could have impacted their summer range. It may not have anything to do with their winter range. Um, I don't know, I mean, wildlife live through, through wildfire all the time, right? Um, either direct or indirect impacts. And so I would suspect that unless an area was that they were utilizing was directly burned, they should probably be able to find other resources. Um, but yeah, it's, again, it's a good question. So we definitely observed the drop here. So whether or not it was a factor or an impact caused by something in the summer from that really large fire season, uh, we did not have anything happen on Mount Jumbo that year. And so I don't think it's a you know, significant drop in habitat quality for their winter range. Yeah. So um, before we uh, thank Jeff, I wanted to ask one last question about what we can do to support the elk herd and the health of Mount Jumbo. We can be elk spotters. Mm -hmm. We can recreate responsibly. Um, are there opportunities, other volunteer opportunities for people to directly contribute? Yes, and we actually are just in the process of hiring essentially a volunteer coordinator, so we should be over the next, I'm going to say six months, we've got to get a little, take a little bit of time to get up to speed, uh, we will be drastically increasing our you know, stewardship-based volunteer opportunities. Largely what that's going to look like on Mount Jumbo might be trail work or reseeding or weed pulls, right? Something that's fairly general. We're not going to ask somebody to go up there Right, and help operate a chainsaw, for example. Um, and so, yes, I do anticipate many more volunteer opportunities, both on Mount Jumbo and elsewhere throughout our conservation land system. And so uh, I will make sure to pass those opportunities along when we have them posted. Thanks, and I've been, as, as you've talked a couple times, I, I glanced out the window to see if the elk were listening in, and I don't see any up okay. there right now. Yeah. So um, thank you, Jeff. This has been very informative and um, really interesting. So let's give Jeff a big thank you. Thank you.